Well, hi, everybody. This is Phil Town. And this is Danielle Town. We're here to talk about rule one investing and what does that actually mean? And who's Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger? And why are they doing the things they're doing in the world and making so much money? And how do we do it too? Um, What to do when you see something in the checkout line and you're like, that's a cool product. Yeah, that's that's who else is buying this? And we were talking last time about Whole Foods, you know, Um, and we got the Whole Foods because you were looking at Justin's nut butter. Yeah, exactly. Well, I was standing in the checkout line at Whole Foods, trying very hard and and succeeding, thank goodness, to resist Justin's peanut butter cups, which are so good. Because they have sugar in them. And because they're made with really good ingredients. Mm. That's why. I mean, like, you can buy the Reese's. They're the same thing, except that they're really not. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> they both have sugar, though. So we, we, we started exploring how you would make an investment in Justin's if you really liked them and found out they weren't public. Yeah, which I suspect would be the case with a lot of those kinds of research opportunities. Yeah, oh, it is. I like this protein bar. Oh, I like this, I don't know, you know, vegetable pur- purveyor, whatever. So one of the things that I think you'll find is that is that when when you be, decide you're going to be a, uh, an investor and you are going to invest your own money with certainty instead of sort of gambling on the stock market, that you start to realize you you're going to need to be more aware of what's going on in the world that you live in. Like good investors read a lot about stuff they're interested in. And they learn a lot. And so if you don't like learning things and you don't like reading and you don't like digging into stuff, then you're probably going to be a lot better off just putting your money into an index and just getting whatever the market gets you. Um, But if you're about 45 years old and you happen to be thinking you want to retire in 20 years, you also have to be aware that you just may not have any kind of return in the stock market at all for 20 years could be a zero rate of return. In that case, you will have wished that you learned how to do this, I think. So that's what we're gonna teach you guys. How do you do this stuff? And there's a, you know, basically Charlie Munger, we did a bunch of series on Charlie Munger and he basically said, hey, all you gotta do is just be capable of understanding the business, make sure it's got a big moat, big durable competitive advantage, and it's got good managers, that makes it a great business to invest in and then you gotta be able to buy it at some really good price. And so, <clears throat> what Charlie and, and he basically said it's so simple anybody could do it and it's so any you know a teacher doesn't teach it in college and because also simple and easy what else would they have to say for the rest of the semester exactly well I think we've just proven that particular claim yeah. but everything else he said we seem to agree with exactly so we're gonna be digging in on this podcast all into that I think you just said something really interesting which is that if you're not all that interested in researching and digging into things and reading and knowing what's going on in the world, this might not be for you. I think most people are interested in that stuff. They just are interested in, (laughs) this is a trite way to say it, but they're interested in what they're interested in. Like, I don't really want to learn about guns or motorcycles. That's your thing. (laughs) I am interested in You make me sound like a gangbanger. Oh God, I'm not trying to say that. Guns Um, and motorcycles. (laughs) <laughs> it's more like I, people are interested in different things, right? So like we were talking about food the last time. That's something I'm really interested in because I have all these digestion problems. And so I've spent a lot of time the last couple of years trying to figure out what on earth I can eat that works for my stomach. So that's something I think a lot about. And I buy food based on that issue. And, um, and that's something I'm interested in reading about. So I think from what we've been talking about, it sounds like Part of this is is thinking about yourself and thinking about what you're really interested in and what you want to spend half an hour in your evening or in your morning reading about. Yeah. Make some introspection. From, from two sides. First, obviously, if you're interested in it, you're going to be willing to, to learn more about it. But also that if you're interested in it, it probably matches your value set and it's something you're going to want to see in the world. So you're going to want to vote for it, presumably, with your money, which mm-hmm. is a big deal, right? So... When we look at going into the markets and putting our money into something, I think of it like, I always use this this acronym, RULERS, to be thinking about it properly. And we'll dive deeper into this. I don't know. 
Rulers, it means first get it on your radar. How did that get on your radar? Then understand the business like Charlie's saying. Oh, it's an acronym of what to do. Yeah, of what to do. It's not people. No, uh -uh. it's like, it's not the kings. It's just radar, understand, love it, you know, match your values. Make sure there's an event that created that that created fear around uh, this company um, or its industry or the markets as a whole. Make sure you understand what that event is. And then once you own the business, employ some really great uh, skill sets that we can teach you guys over time on this podcast to reduce your basis and get your money off the table so you don't have any market risk. You want to remove the risk that the market drops and stays down out of this investment so you make money no matter what. And um, <laughs> I just got busted for eating eating Stop raspberries. Stop eating on the podcast, Dad. I just got busted for eating raspberries here. Nobody wants to hear you chew. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Oh my gosh. Danielle is in Boulder, Colorado, and I'm in a little town south of Atlanta, and we are communicating via Skype, and it's so awesome. I get to look and just see see you, and you're in Boulder. It's so amazing. I love it. Technology, man. Yeah, Tech it's pretty cool, and we can do this. So she caught me eating raspberries here because it's lunchtime, and we're just having fun cranking this out while the, the uh, day is kind of going along here. So let's, let's come back to Justin's for a second and see, all right, let's tie our values in here, and let's figure out how to make an investment in something like Justin's, which is a value uh, investment for us because we like the fact that it's organic and it's doing all this good stuff. Turns right out- now, are we are we sort of in the first, um, what did Charlie call it? The first principle of investing, which is being capable of understanding the business? Is that yes. the realm that we're in? Exactly what we're doing. It comes to those four principles. Right, first it had to get on our radar and it got on our radar um, via something we already like and enjoy. Mm -hmm. And now we're at understanding. Are we capable of understanding this business? That's what we want to figure out here. And we're going to know that pretty quick because it's going to get really boring to read about it. And really, we're going to get sick of it in a big hurry if this isn't something we're interested in. Absolutely. It starts to feel like work. Yeah, no, it shouldn't feel like work. Not Investing fun. should be really fun. Yeah. I'm trying to think about it for myself as just learning about the world. Because I think we started this out and I say this all the time, I'm not interested in investing and I don't want to do it. So I have to find a way to make it work for me or else I'm not going to start to do it. And what I'm learning through talking and through doing this podcast with you is that there are little tricks I can make in my mind to make myself want to do it. And one of those, one of the first ones is focusing on things I'm interested in and just treating it like fun, treating it like, oh, today I get to learn about something that's going on that, that you know, I maybe wouldn't have carved out time to learn about otherwise. And, and don't forget, you know, ultimately this is gonna make you very rich. <laughs> <laughs> I love how confident you are. If in that. you needed more motivation, it isn't just an exercise in voting for the future, it is also designed as a very practical way to have a very wonderful life you know, doing what you want to do with it. That's, I don't know if that's a great motivator. <clears throat> Apparently not. It's not, right, because if that were true, everyone would be doing it. We would be learning about it in grade school, and we would be practicing in high school and then making a little bit of money and starting to do it. And it's just not, it's too abstract, it's too in the future, and it's too uncertain. People lose money in the stock market constantly. And I understand that you're very confident about it, but I have not gained that confidence yet. And I think it's going to take a lot of practice before I'm there. It's gonna take, what did we call it? Fantasy trading or paper trading, where you um, you know, write down that you wrote, a, that you purchased a company without actually having done it. Yeah. And, and seeing that that, goes in the correct direction, seeing that it is possible to make a, a good call. It's going to take some practice for me to get there. Well, I, th I think you've made a couple of really interesting comments here. One is that, you know, investing isn't interesting. It's not, <laughs> it's risky. 
It's uh, and and the proof of that is that we don't teach it because obviously if it made people wealthy, we would teach it in in grade school. We would teach it. Well, in high I was school. I was saying that more in the sense that it's um, it's not that interesting, and the payoff isn't certain enough that it's become worthwhile. But what if the payoff was certain? In other words, certain enough that makes it worthwhile to at least invest in an index, right? To put your money away. Because I don't think you could point to anybody. I, I think anybody who put money away in the stock market started in their 20s and just continued a disciplined investment strategy of taking a small portion of what they earn and put it into the stock market, religiously do it, and wake up when you're 65 and take a look at what you've got, you'd be a multimillionaire for sure. Guaranteed. For sure. Yeah, Guaranteed. for sure. Guaranteed. Like in any time frame in the stock market, it doesn't matter. You could start in 1929 and you'd still be a multimillionaire by the time you retired in the 1960s. So no question in my mind that uh, there's something else going on that prevents us from teaching this in high school because it is absolutely as guaranteed a way to have a successful re retirement as is possible in the world without knowing anything about stock investing. All you'd have to do is know that compounding a little bit of money in the stock market over a long period of time of 40 years is going to produce a very, very big pile of money at the other end. There's some other, you know, I think- last episode, you said that the market goes sideways for many, many years at a time, and you would come out with the exact same amount of money. If you, you did it over a 20 year period of time, you can't be assured of having a great return in your in your portfolio, but over any forty year period of time, yeah, you're you're assured. From everything we've seen in the last history of our country, you're assured of that. So, in effect, two things: you're basically betting on America. Right? <laughs> <laughs> if you're buying domestic companies, if you're buying domestic companies, you're betting on America, and you could even diversify away from that pretty easily without knowing anything about investing. Um, but you have to know enough about investing to know you should be doing it and you know and to know that it in fact would come out very well for you. And it's amazing to me. People don't know that and they don't teach it in school. It tells me that the people who teach and the people who administrate and the people who vote for the school board and the supervisors, none of them know about this. Or they know and they just don't want to do it slash are afraid of it. But they all have a 401k. One right? hopes. One ho well, yeah, but they, people just don't put any money in it, yeah. right? They don't just really load it up. They don't do a Roth IRA and really build it up. I mean, right now, the average baby boomer has about $80,000 to retire on. And that, that's an impossibly low amount of money if you'd been putting money in the stock market for the last you know, 40 years, it's an impossibly low amount. You couldn't have $80,000. You would have to have 800,000 or 1.7 million or, you know, 3.6 million. You'd, you'd have to have a big pile because the power of compounding would have made virtually any amount of money you put in there of any significance into a fortune, a small fortune. And, in, and instead you have nothing. And so people's basic financial uh, understanding is so bad because we don't teach it. And we don't teach it because our teachers don't know. And that's a horrible thing. I, I think we really have to work on that. We gotta- I think it would be great to work on that. Yeah, we gotta I, get financial I'm literacy. I'm sitting here thinking that I grew up with somebody who's an investor and I had every opportunity to learn this stuff. And, you know, I, I tried a couple times. Um, and I have not found that way in that has made it really interesting for me. And I think that's true for a lot of people. Well, that's what we're gonna try to do here. Is to, that's what I'm trying to do for yeah, sure. Yeah, tie into the things that really make you interested. And, and part of that is chocolate. And <laughs> <laughs> chocolate and peanut butter has made you interested. In the shape of a cup. In the shape of a little cup, or in a little squeeze bag, and, and so, we, we've started in with that, and I think we really need to dive into that a little bit here. Because yeah. we've got we to gotta kind of move the ball down the road in terms of what do we need to do in order to really get up to speed on something that might be fun to invest in. So we sort of found our way into Whole Foods via this desire to eat this 
illicit peanut butter. And, <laughs> and now we've got to figure out, gee, Whole Foods, that's a grocery store full of stuff. Do I have to learn each and every product in this store one at a time? Or can I just learn about stores in general? And, and that's, that's, let's just start with stores in general. What do you like about Whole Foods? What is it about that company that, that you appreciate? Why do you go shop there? I trust the products that they have in the store. I trust that they're going to be well sourced. They have ingredients that are going to be healthy for me. They are usually ethical in some general way. Um, their meat and fish products, I think, don't have any antibiotics in any of them. I think even the non-organic stuff doesn't have antibiotics, which is something that's very important to me. They are clear on their labels about where things come from. And, um, and generally, people who work there seem to be pretty happy. So I feel like it's a good place to put my money. Cool. I really like that, especially I like everything you said in terms of trying to understand the business. Oh, salad bar is really good. <laughs> the salad bar is killer. I also love it that you said that the employees are pretty happy you were working there um, because I love investing in a company where there are passionate employees. I just think that's just such a great sign for the future of the company. And at Whole Foods, one of the one of the things that's so amazing about it, when you go to the Whole Foods, let's say at Hillcrest in uh, in San Diego, um, over where your sister lives, those guys are tattooed, um, making a public statement about their sexual preferences. They got ear ear studs. Uh, you were so funny. You had such a reaction to like those people at Whole Foods. <laughs> They're completely normal, just because they have tattoos and they work at Whole Foods. I don't see the big deal. Well, okay, but I'm not making a big deal out of it. I'm just saying that's the crew they've got on board there. And yeah. and there's a, there's a type that works at Whole Foods in Hillcrest. And it's a different type that works at Whole Foods in Georgia, right? But they, they're in both places, there are people that are really passionate about what they're doing around food. I mean, that's yeah. why they're there. It's just interesting that you saw some sort of like contradiction between being tatted up and wanting to eat good food and working at Whole Foods. I don't see any contradiction between that. I don't know. So. I don't see a contradiction. Oh, okay. I didn't mean it to sound like one. I'm just saying that these are not mainstream corporate employees. All right. Okay. I can appreciate that. Right? Yeah. And yet, it it's exciting that these non-mainstream lifestyle-oriented people are in that company working a nine-to-five job almost because it's not a life it, because it is a lifestyle kind of a job it fits into their whole um value set right it's cool to care about food right now it's cool to care about it it's cool to bag groceries at whole foods yeah totally cool to do that corporate discounting on your groceries and you get a discount there you go so uh, it, it always fascinates me to look at who's working there and and see what how their values are matching up and all that. Because I think that when you have a company where the people share the values of the business, you've got what can become a steamroller major league home run. And that's, of course, what we love to invest in is companies that are going to do really, really well. But first, we have to understand what are the values of this business. And you just named a whole bunch of them. But if I didn't know those things, what I could do is go over and Google Whole Foods and click on it. And I would come up with WholeFoodsMarket.com. And I'm going to click on that. So again, we're going just straight to that company's website for yep. a stop when we want to research them. Yep. Okay. And um, and I'm seeing all kinds of stuff about the things. Get to know the pollinators. <laughs> beauty that's more than skin deep. My gosh, there's so much stuff here. It says I want to. These are all menu items. Show me food, people, planet. And and I know from reading about Whole Foods is that John Mackey started this company with this basic moral idea that if you can have whole food, natural, good quality food, then you're going to get whole people who are healthy. And then when you get healthy people, you're going to get a healthy planet. So whole food, whole people, whole planet. And, and that moral code runs through this company like an iron rod. And everybody is magnetized to come to that or they don't join this company. So you read about it all right there. And then it says, I want to learn, do both. And then it says, view our stores, our stories and your stories. So 
right at the right in the middle of the page here is just like all kinds of stuff about what this company is all about. And then it's got find yeah, a store. It's interesting to see how they choose to market themselves. Yeah. What's important, what they put on their main website splash page. Yeah, it can tell me a lot about what they care about and what they want to be putting out there. Absolutely. This is something they control entirely. There's no filter between the company and us on their website. Absolutely. Now, I'm going to save myself a bunch of reading um, by going down. First, I'm looking at the top menu items and it says menu, so I'm clicking on that. And what comes up is a sidebar that says healthy eating about our products, recipes, online ordering, mission values, blog, store department. So that's not what I'm looking for. Then it's find a store, then on sale, then recipes, then shop online, then sign and register. None of those are what I'm looking for. What are you looking for? I'm looking for investor relations. So if it's not right there at the top of the page, then I'm going to scroll to the bottom of the page because often it's there. And I'm looking for a major category called company. And there I see it, company. Then it's about Whole Foods. Here's all the subtext. And the third one down is investor relations. That's what I'm looking for. Now, the shortcut to that is Google Whole Foods investor relations, and it'll come up with this link. So I'm going to click on that because what I'm going to do is shortcut all of the reading on all their stuff by going straight to their 10K. So now I'm going to scroll down here where it says investor relations, and I'm going to look for annual reports. Um, and that will get me to their 10K. So review our annual stakeholder report. So I'm going to click on that. A 10K is another name for the annual report of the company. It is. It is kind of. It's a subtext of the annual report. Sometimes companies build a big pile of, of color pages around this 10K um, where they have a chance to explain in more marketing terms how wonderful they are. But the 10K is the nitty gritty. And what I see on Whole Foods here is um, Annual Stakeholders Report 2014, Form 10K PDF and Form 10K A PDF 1.5. So let's go the to the 10K. 10K itself is what is filed with the SEC. That's right. And now and I'm going to click on that. Add additional information around that that's not filed with the SEC? They, they can in a way. Like, for example, there's stuff all about their website that's not literally filed with the SEC. But that 10K better cover all of it and disclose and disclaim and all that. So the 10K is the nitty gritty. And on this, you can see that this is the 2014 report. Then right below that is the 2013, then the 2012, then the 2011, then the 2010, 9, 8, 7. So it goes all the way back to 2007. Now, if I've got a couple of hours here, and I want to just kind of start at the beginning, I would go to the 2007 10K and start reading that one. <clears throat> and just read It'll forward. Start back as early as you can go. Yeah, go way back. And that way it'll just give you a, a kind of a flow of the development of the company. But if I've just got a few minutes to just kind of say, gee, am I interested? Can I, can I get an understanding of this business? I'm going to click on the current 10K. And what comes up is a sort of a scary looking document. That is the SEC filing. The first page is just loaded with all kinds of very legally looking stuff. Just scroll through that. You don't need to look at that. That's nothing. And you get down to. The, the, don't sorry. look at him, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> those, of you, stuff. those of you who are just tuning in, Danielle is a lawyer. She's <laughs> definitely interested in making sure you read this stuff. So you get to the the to the title page and the table of contents. And it says part one, business risk factors, unresolved staff comments, properties, legal proceedings, and so on. And then part two is the market for the stock, selected financial data. And then item seven is management's discussion and analysis of financial condition and results of operations. Okay, so I'm gonna really dive into this three basic things here. I'm going to say item one, which is business, that's page one. Item 1A, which is risk factors, that's page 11. And then I'm going to roll down to item seven, which is page 20. So for me to get a grip on the business, I've got to read 11 pages, 12, 13, 14 pages plus um, item seven is about 10. So I've got to read like about to read 24 pages. The 
business section, the risk factor section, and what was the third one? Management's discussion. Okay. Manage, so business, risk factors, and management's discussion. Yep. And that'll give you a pretty good overview of what's going on in this business. So that's, that's where I would go. So let's, let's bounce over to page one here and we see what it starts off at. And it says, Whole Foods is the leading retailer of natural and organic foods, the first national certified organic grocer, uniquely positioned as America's healthiest grocery store, and that is a trademark. Um, company is incorporated in, incorporated in 78, IPO was in 1992, and so on. So they're starting, they'll tell you the history, and it says, through our growth, I would say our mission is devoted to the promotion of organically grown foods, healthy eating, and the sustainability of our entire ecosystem. So I'm looking for a statement from the company, any company I look at, I'm looking for a statement of what makes them special, what are, what's driving the train here. And so that's the, there's the statement. We're devoted to the promotion of organically grown foods, healthy eating, sustainability of the entire ecosystem. Okay. So that's really important I understand what they're about. Now, they may say they're about a lot of stuff, they may not deliver on it. So I need to learn about that too. But as we dig into Whole Foods, we'll find out that they, they definitely try to deliver on this. Okay, then they say, we have one operating segment, natural and organic food supermarkets. That's all we do, that's our thing. We're the largest, it tells you how many stores they've got, seventh largest public retailers. Um, and all about their stores. Then they go the industry overview now, and they tell us about the U.S. supermarket industry, how big it is, what piece they have of it, and so on. Now they talk about the organic food portion of the huge industry, and what's going on with that. Then they say our core purpose and core values. This is what we do, and that's pretty cool. Then they go our qualities and differentiated product offering. Now this is what I'm looking for. Charlie said, First, are you capable of understanding the business? And second, do they have some kind of durable competitive advantage? And so what I'm looking for is what do they think makes them special? So here's what, and usually they say what makes them special and usually a sentence or two that says we're differentiated from our, our competition in this way. So we're looking for those words differentiated from. So we believe high quality standards differentiate our stores from other supermarkets and enable us to attract and maintain a broad base of loyal customers. Our groundbreaking quality standards ensure the products we sell meet a higher standard, one that bans hundreds of ingredients found in other stores, as well as numerous manufacturing, farming, fishing, and ranching practices that don't measure up. And then they lay out their quality standards. Now the next thing they tell us is they offer the broadest selection of high quality, natural and organic products with a strong emphasis of perishable foods. So that's the broadest selection, that's a, that's a competitive advantage. Average stores carry as many as 49,000 SKUs, and they go into all the stuff that they offer. Then we also have exclusive brands, which gives us an advantage in the marketplace. We're committed to local producers, which gives us an advantage in the marketplace. We are committed to animal welfare as promoting animal welfare on farms and ranches and innovative animal production. So they go on and on about what their standards are for making their company special. Then they tell us their growth strategy, what, how they're planning on growing this company. And they say that over the last 15 years, our, our store sales average 8% growth rate just on each store. And then we're continuing to add more stores. And, and so the combination of those two will help us grow our business so you can understand where your money will be made down the road. So all of this stuff is disclosed and they get all the way down to the team members. We created 8,800 new jobs in fiscal 2014. We got 87,000 team members. Um, and our team members have helped Whole Foods become one of Fortune Magazine's 100 best companies to work for in America. We're only thir one of 13 companies to make the 100 best, best list every year since its inception. Well, as an investor, that would matter to me because ultimately, you know, my investment is being handled by people and if they love their company, man, that's a hot thing to do. So they tell us all about their team members, how they treat people. Now they get into competition. Our competition includes all kinds of things, especially supermarkets, natural food stores, warehouse memberships, online retailers and so on. So we're gonna to have to learn about a lot of these different companies and we'll talk about later about where you'd find out who they are.
So those things all are what are written up in the 10K. So you can see, I mean, we could talk about the 10K here for a long time. You can see that the 10K is loaded with important stuff about this company. And that's yeah, what you have to go learn about. Here. And there's a lot that's, uh, there's some trade vocabulary here that I think requires a little bit of maybe Googling and investigation to make sure that you really understand what you're reading. Yep, and now somewhere right in here, you start to turn the lights off <laughs> or you get more interested. It's, it's gonna go one of those two ways. If you're just starting to go, oh man, this is just dreary, horrible, nasty stuff, I don't wanna learn about it, then that's an indication of one of two things. Either one, you better go back to indexing. Your, your 401k shouldn't should be invested in indexes and forget about investing on your own. Forget about making high rates of return with low risk and stick to a 7% average and hope to God that it doesn't go down in the next 20 years. So like get interested or else, is that what you're saying? <laughs> Just from my point of view. You know? can, I offer, can I offer an alternate perspective? Sure, go ahead. 10Ks are kind of boring to read. Well, okay, they are written by lawyers. So I mean, they're yeah. bound to be very carefully worded. It's not a novel. That's right. It's a legal, it's a legal document that's submitted to the SEC. Yep. It's not and, meant to be a page turner. And like everything lawyers write, they always tend to, I mean, you could tell me, but I just think that our lawyers tend to, to write everything thinking of how this is going to be perceived in a lawsuit. Absolutely. Yeah. So, okay, it's not going to be the most exciting reading in the world. So don't feel like you really shouldn't be an investor if you start to get a little bit bored through it. Um, I read these things to Melissa at night, and she goes to sleep inside of 30 seconds when I start into a 10K. And usually I'm out in about half an hour. <laughs> so, okay, they are not it's dynamic reading. Cure I hadn't thought of. Yeah, it's not Les Miserables, okay? It's not, it's not, a, it's not a, a novel. But I think your point was, you've got to be somewhat interested in what they're talking about here, even if it is written dryly and boringly and uh, uh, with lots of graphs. And, and I, I think I'll go back to Charlie's words on this. After reading this bit here, after reading for a few pages, if you feel you're not capable of understanding this, it's time mm -hmm. to move away from this business. That's a great word. I mean, of course, that's the word he used, that's, and that's right. That's very, very accurate terminology from Charlie. And, and it's, it's important that you decide, I am capable of understanding this. If I dig in, if I'm willing to you know, put myself through the process of learning and reading, then I will be able to understand this business. And truly, if you read the financial documents uh, of a company, you almost can't help. If you read five years of, of the 10Ks, you almost can't help but be an expert in that industry. It's gonna make you an expert if you can just get through it. So you sort of, you know, grit your teeth a little bit and just take a little bit at a time. If you only can handle 15 minutes, then fine, it's 15 minutes. And if you can handle an hour, you go and do an hour. And something with legal documents like this that um, I find useful in my practice is that as you, when you're reading a new document, it all just seems so confusing. It seems like Greek, you know, it's just, words that you're not used to and a format that you're not used to, you read a few of them and it starts to become more familiar pretty quickly. And then you maybe read five or six and maybe the seventh, you start to just, you, you, you become so used to it that you can skip through the stuff you, you need to skip through and you can get to the important stuff much more quickly. And by the time you read your 20th or your 30th, it's old hat you're going to be very comfortable with it. Well, that's encouraging because it's only going to take 20 or 30 of these. And I don't know how, I mean, these things are probably 90 pages or something, but a lot of it's just financial stuff that we'll talk about later. Um, so maybe it takes, you know, once you know Whole Foods is something you definitely are interested in, then maybe it takes an hour to read through the first one. And maybe half an hour for the second or an hour for the second and the third and the fourth. So you're gonna dedicate maybe, you know, five to 10 hours to your financial future here to decide if you really are willing to do the work. 
five to 10 hours will tell you. Because once you've done those, those, those five of them, you're, it should start to become pretty routine. You should, you're gonna see the same things over and over again. You'll have fought your way through the, the way the terminology is, and you're gonna see, oh yeah, I, this is familiar to me. So I really like what you said there, that's cool. Yeah, and I'm just thinking to myself how, how I'm gonna do this, and I think probably the best plan. I've read a number of 10Ks, but I've never read a grocery store 10K. So this is unfamiliar to me. So I'm thinking, okay, if I need to learn about this industry well enough that I can really understand the words that they're using and compare different companies in this industry so, so that I can see the differences. Um, it's very hard to tell what's unusual about a legal document or a 10K without having read a number of them so that you can say, oh, I read seven of them and they all say X and this one says Y. So that's a difference. So I should notice that. Yep. Um, so what I'm thinking is maybe I'll, I would read through Whole Foods, then go read, well, I don't know, how many companies would you recommend? Just five, six, ten companies that are in this industry? Oh, man. Four, four more. Four, four more would do it. And then I would come back to this Whole Foods one where I started and read it again and see if I notice anything else. I think that that might be my plan. Yep. Well, I think we got to kind of talk about um, where you would find some of these other companies. Oh, great. Yeah. Wait, because I do not know the answer to that. Right. So if you were to go over to our website, which you can climb on and use if you want, and we're not here to promote our website, but it's ruleoneinvesting.com, and you can you know go in there and use it for free for a month. Um, what you can do on that website is go to the peers. So we're going to go over here right now, Danielle, over to the website. It's rule1investing.com, and you just sign up for it and get instant access. And I'm going to go in and log in. <clears throat> and what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in the name of a company that I know in this industry, which in this point in our research, the only one I know is Whole Foods. So I'm going to type in Whole, and what comes up is Whole Foods Market and Costco Wholesale. So I'm clicking Whole Foods Market on the, uh, the little stock at a glance thing, and I'm gonna say go. And it's gonna go over to Whole Foods' first page on our website, which just gives you a bunch of information about the company. Um, and I'm gonna go on the left column to peers, click that, and it's gonna give me a list of companies that are similar to Whole Foods. And what I see is I've got about 15 of them in here. It's, <laughs> standardized industry groups in the market there's no nobody's actually standardized them really I mean the SEC has certain classifications but they dial it down so tight that when people who compile data put it together they use different names and so this is industry peers for grocery stores um, so that's pretty close I mean this one's pretty easy um, and what we see is we've got yeah, this it, one's much easier because it's there's companies that we're all familiar with like Costco yeah. Exactly. Walmart, et cetera. Um, so it would be more difficult in an industry that's not consumer facing. Exactly. And But even so, when we look at the grocery stores, it's going to give us them by market cap. And the first one we get is Kroger's with $37 billion, which means market cap means, by the way, the number of shares that the company has out there times the price per share. It just means what that thing is selling for if you bought the whole company today. Uh, if you could magically do that at today's market price, you'd pay $37.85 billion for it. So it's the largest grocery store out there that's public and is specifically a grocery store because Walmart's not on here and neither is Costco because they are conglomerate. They do a bunch of stuff inside their store. Oh, yeah. So see, that, that's what makes it a little harder. I excited about Costco there. I love Costco. Yeah, I know. So. Another, another way to go here is, well, we'll come back to that. Well, I'll show you more on that in another time. We don't have enough time today. But um, right now we're looking at Kroger Safeway, the Del Hayes Group, um, which I don't think is US. Then we've got the a Brazilian Distribution Group. Then Casey's General Stores. Those are those little stores at gas stations. Super value. The Fresh Market is definitely a Whole Foods competitor. Um, that's a good one. Yeah, the Fresh Market's a good one. That's a real interesting one. So we should read that one. Read Safeway, read Kroger. And um, here's Ingalls Market, Weiss Market, the Pantry. 
So there's a there's a bunch of them here that are similar. So fresh market. It's interesting that there are company. other ones I've never heard of those ones you just mentioned. Well, so skip I those. They're regional chains. Yeah, regional chains. But I would definitely read Kroger, Safeway, um, the Fresh Market, and then um, and we all we know that Costco and Holt and Walmart are out there. We can go dig up those guys. But Why that would give us the ones that you aren't familiar with. Um, hey, read on. I mean, if you don't know anything about Casey General Stores, just a couple of minutes in their 10K will tell you that they're small, little, fast, fast. You know, they're not they're not competitive with Whole Foods. They don't do the same business. Weiss okay, Markets, so I don't know. To look at each one that you don't quite know what they are and just see yeah. if you think that they're competitive with the the company we started out with. Yeah. So let, let's. I don't know. Let's go look Some at Weiss Markets. They're just competitive. Right You're. Your website's algorithm thinks they're competitive. So. Yeah, they're, they fall into that category, right? But it's it's often the categories are too broad. Now I'm going to Weiss Markets, and I'm looking at this, and I said, get grilling at Weiss. Prices lowered for 90 days on seasonal stuff. And they got all the coupons, effortless shopping, everyday recipes. Um, I'm clicking on their shopping tab. Party platters, online shopping, gift cards, club cards savings. Oh, here's one called Healthy Living. Let's see what they say there. Uh, looking for nutrition information, browse our archives, healthy bites, easy to make recipes, special diets, healthy cooking. So healthy is an afterthought at Weiss. I mean, that's pretty obvious. It's They just aren't in the ballpark of what Whole Foods does. And you'll make that decision just from their website. Yeah, it's pretty simple. I mean, I'm, we're just looking for broad strokes here. And so if I said, okay, I need to know more about these guys, um, how would I find it out? And so since these guys are a shopping store, a lot of times they don't put their investor relations anywhere where you can find it. You got to go down to the bottom and you got to look at like company or about Weiss is something here. And what I'm seeing is about Weiss and it goes, Corporate information. Okay, so I don't see anything else that says investor relations. So I'm going to click on corporate information. See what I get. Okay, corporate information. Reviewing information on our, they're making it hard here. Okay, so reviewing information of our financial. I'm going to click on financial. There we go. So they buried their financial information. Yeah. Deep down in there. That's so the way you get it here is you go to about Weiss and then instead of corporate information, click on financial, which I just didn't see. So there's financial and now we're at the 10K. So I go, okay, let me have a 10K and it's gonna bring it up as some kind of XML file. Let's see what that does. Oh, that's a train wreck. I can't even read it. Um Wow. Are they going to give me a viewer that I can look at? They're making this very hard. And that makes me concerned, right? So they're giving me an SEC viewer. Good Lord. When something like this happens, I haven't seen anybody this bad in a long time. Does it affect your opinion of the company overall? Yeah, it tells me they're being run by people who aren't very uh, smart about investor relations. Like, they're, why are they so, why are they making it so difficult for me to find information about them? Absolutely, it affects me. Golly, that is really horrible. All right, well, I'm going to go back to my website because we usually list all of the uh, SEC documents right here as well. So I'm going to click on um, that stock itself, which is got a WMK. WMK as the symbol, Weiss Markets. And I am going to go to SEC documents here if I can. So now we're going over to the main page and click on SEC forms. And hopefully we will have put it in a form that we can actually read here if they've allowed us to do that. So we're waiting for our data to be supplied. What I'm going to look at is just I'm going to go on to this SEC document and I'm going to just kind of download or just kind of read really quickly what does this market do. And um, I'm going to look at the 10K, which is right there. And yeah, we do have it in a PDF form here. So good. I click on that. 
and it's uh, downloading that, and there it is. So by the way, the, the stuff I'm doing right now, sort of live on the podcast, is unbelievable compared to what just 30 years ago, what you could do. You, even 15 years ago, you couldn't really do this very well. Um, and never before in the history of investing has the little guy had access to this kind of information with this kind of speed. And speed is everything. I mean, if it takes you forever to get information, you're just not gonna be that focused on it. I mean, you, maybe you didn't start investing when you were 11 like Warren Buffett, but you're just looking at it now and you wanna make it as easy as possible. So this well, makes it so much easy, easier. But we are all busy and, and we, do, we don't have the busy. time to be searching for documents. I mean, I, I certainly don't. Well, here it is. This company is founded by Harry and Sigmund Weiss in 1912, incorporated in 24, and engaged in retail sale of food in Pennsylvania um, and some surrounding states. So there's been no material change in the nature of the business in fiscal 2014. It's been public since 65. And here's why it's so hard to understand this company. The Weiss family currently owns approximately 65% of the outstanding shares. Oh, maybe they don't want a lot of trading. In they the don't care. They don't care. That actually makes me more interested in the company to know that it's family run by the same family since the very beginning and that they own such a large chunk of it. That makes me think that they have a real stake in its future progress. They really do. Uh, they have a huge, huge stake in its future progress. And what I would be looking for is, does this company match my values? Um, and uh, now I wanna dig in deep and to see if it has a moat. Um, how are they protecting themselves against other companies in the Pennsylvania region to keep themselves you know, viable? They've been around for a long, long, long time, but then so were newspapers. So has something, <laughs> has something happened here that is going to create a problem? And why haven't they expanded out of Pennsylvania? <laughs> exactly. Or at least the Northeast. I don't know where they are. Well, they own 163 retail food stores. Um, the customer utilizes a loyalty marketing program called Weiss Club Preferred Shopper, which provides discounts, promotions, and fuel award rewards. And my gut is that these guys are a price-driven uh, uh a price-driven moat. That, that's what they're trying to do is they're trying to compete on the basis of price. Um, and at least that's my first cut at this. I don't see anything else that tells me anything about them. Let's see, the companies, uh, I'm looking for information that would tell me what they do that makes them special. And I just don't see anything Looking for competitors to Whole Foods because just having been around during the rise of Whole Foods, I know that part of the reason that they had such a precipitous rise is because there were no competitors to Whole Foods. Right. I mean, there are your local. There used to be your local natural food stores, which were always tiny and completely local and had nothing to do with any like large companies, and, and that often was even part of their philosophy of existing. Um, and then Whole Foods came along and really revolutionized the grocery world of being a large corporation, being a chain, being in multiple states, and having the same values as these tiny little local natural food stores. Yeah, so you've got to look at, at these things that Charlie are saying are just so critical. He's saying, are you capable of understanding? We're going, okay, we've read five of these companies. We're pretty capable of understanding a grocery store. Um, these guys are competing on price. Let's stipulate. Yeah, let's stipulate. <laughs> we'll understand grocery store. So what we're, what we're trying to understand about, about these things, by the way, is how do they compete? What, I mean, how do, you, how do you stay in business if you are to open a grocery store? And how hard would it be to open a grocery store and compete against this company that we're looking at? Those are the key things. How do they compete and how hard it would be to compete with Whole Foods? So we're looking at Weiss Markets. They don't compete with Whole Foods. They are, from everything I can read right now, these guys are about location of the business. They've been around a long, long time, so they have a lot of loyalty. And I, I, my gut is that they just compete on price. Mm -hmm. So they go out there to get the cheapest stuff they can and put it in the store. Um, and they're like, I'm, yeah. And so we're gonna look at each one of these. We go to Kroger's, we go to Safeway, and then we start looking at companies 
that do compete with Whole Foods, right? Like what else competes with Whole Foods? And we, we gradually find that we are able to find a small group, a group of companies that we now know something about because we've read that 10K. And so, okay, can't, so let's check off Charlie's first box. Are we capable of understanding this business? And we're gonna stipulate we are. We're, okay. gonna, we're gonna say, yeah. I like that, stipulate. I'm gonna use that a lot. We're gonna Great. stipulate we are capable of understanding grocery, grocery stores. Okay, now, now that we're capable of that, we wanna know how do these guys compete and how does Whole Foods in particular compete against everybody else in a way that makes them untouchable. You're not gonna knock them out of the box, no matter what you do. Like if you had all, if Whole Foods is worth about $18 billion right now in the market, if you had $18 billion, like Warren Buffett, do you think that you could go in and knock these guys out and take their market by investing that $18 billion? You'd have to think, well, what could I do to create a company that would take these guys out. Yeah, what could I do the better than Whole Foods already does it? Yeah, so <laughs> you think, okay, well, how do they compete? So that's the first thing you have to know is, how does Whole Foods compete in the market? And we learned that there are just a handful of ways that companies can compete. Just a really small number. And we're gonna have to These talk about those next time. These are the competitive advantages that we discussed? Yeah. Just okay. a small number of things. So let's dive in next time into Whole Foods um, and the grocery store business and find out what are the few competitive advantages that they might have and then see if we had $18 billion, could we knock them out of the box? Yeah, yeah, and then we can move on to the other ones as well once we've first decided that we're capable of understanding it, then we're talking about the competitive advantage, then we can go on to their management. Absolutely. Finally, the price. That's going to take a little while, I think. I yeah, think we're... we might be on this a minute. Yeah, this is good, though, because <laughs> it's such a prolific company. Most people have been in a Whole Foods at some point um, who are listening to this, and, and we can all appreciate what it does pretty easily. Yep. All right. Well, until then, I guess it's time to go play. See ya. Bye. Thanks for listening to Invested, the Rule One podcast. If you like us, please subscribe and leave a review for us on iTunes. You can get our notes and links for this podcast and post comments about this show and get more information about how to invest on your own by going to ruleonepodcast.com. Everything we've discussed in this podcast is either Danielle's opinion or my opinion and is not to be taken as investment advice because I am not your investment advisor, nor have I considered your personal situation as your fiduciary. This podcast is for your entertainment and education only, and I hope you've enjoyed it. So until next week, it's time to go play. See ya.